nice to be between you and lunch. So I will uh, be respectful of that. But um, no, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of the background myself too, just kind of helps talk about some of the topics we're going to go into. Um, I started up running a dial-up ISP, and for my young friend here has no idea what that is probably, uh, but uh, you know, that was um, the days of dialing up to the internet and the annoying noise of the modem sitting in a closet in some, somebody's house. Um, so we actually grew through acquisition. This was back in the uh, mid to late 90s. We did 25 acquisitions in 28 months. I would highly advise against that in today's day. Um, but it was something that uh, we grew to a point where we actually had 120,000 subscribers uh, paying us 20 bucks a month uh, for dial-up ISP throughout the Midwest. Um, grew that to a point, sold it to a private equity group based out of Colorado. Uh, they took it, they grew it a little bit more and then sold it to Earthlink. Uh, and then at that point, I, I started my career more on a private equity side where the company in Colorado owned several companies throughout the country, a garbage truck manufacturer, a foundry that made gray iron castings, a stainless steel distributor. So very diverse um, and, and really helped grow those companies. Uh, those companies really grew to a point with the plan being an eventual sale. So uh, there was not a set model of raise a fund, five years, sell it, but it, everyone's day was coming that it was going to sell. Uh, we sold several companies as far as the foundry. We sold to another uh, uh, metals company. We sold the garbage truck company to Navistar. Uh, and then uh, as I started to spend, as we started to sell more and more companies, we had a company that we owned over in Okahumpka. How many of you have been to Okahumpka? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Everyone else can get your bucket list out and come on up and visit me and cross it off. Um, but uh, Okahumpka is uh, on the south side of Leesburg up in Lake County here. And uh, that was a, the good old All-American story. Gentleman started out his garage, made a vacuum excavator 22 years ago, drove till he sold it, came back, and uh, here we are, we're about to make our 8,000th unit. So um, it's something that as I started to sell, as we started to sell off the other companies I had more bandwidth, I took my time and started, it became CEO over at Vactron. Um, that has been, I was there for about three and a half years, and then we just recently orchestrated a sale of that company to Vermeer, which is um, a very large organization, a billion plus company based out of Iowa, manufactures all types of equipment, directional drills, chippers, stump grinders, um, and, and we are their manufacturing plant for vacuum excavators. So I, I'm now running that facility as the general manager for Vermeer MV Solutions, <laughs> which is their vacuum excavation arm. So uh, never a dull day in my life. Um, with that, you know, some of my experiences that have uh, applicable as to the topic here of getting ready for a slowing economy, and none of us want to think about it, but we all have been around long enough to know that it is coming. Um, you know, I've weathered the dot-com bubble with the, uh, the days of our mentality at the dial-up ISP was to acquire 100,000 subscribers, buy them at $100 a head, and then sell them at $200 a head before we even knew who those heads were. Um, bought at $100 a head, market tanked, now we're operating 25 companies. Um, so now we're going through that whole process of consolidation, taking 25 billing platforms, consolidating those, taking 25 dial-up networks, consolidating those, and uh, taking that and changing your business model like that. So that's something that, uh, you know, we've all, for those that were involved in the tech bubble, that obviously was a, a painful time period. Also on a bankruptcy side, uh, the private equity group that I was involved with bought several companies out of bankruptcy. Uh, the garbage truck company we, we had up in Kentucky, we actually bought out of bankruptcy and then took it to the next level and kind of stabilized it and grew it from there. And then also as far as falling market share at an industry leader. Vactron's a, a story where um, has, as, a, as you see a fair amount of times, entrepreneurs are, that's what the heart of this, com this country is, is entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are not always the greatest operators. Um, and so we had a situation where our market share grew, our market share grew to about a 35% market share and then hit the floor at about a 14% market share. So, uh, and those are things that happened with the uh, ready, fire, aim mentality. Um, and sometimes not always thinking things through and focusing on the changes that need to happen and the steps and the processes, processes that need to happen to get it there. Name that movie. Moneyball, Money there we go. Um, Moneyball is one of my favorite movies. I'm a, I was a math major at Notre Dame. I'm a stats junkie. I'm, I'm from Boston originally. It's been a rough three months since our last championship, so uh, bear with me, but uh, sorry. Too early, all right. Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, so I mean, I think something that, Moneyball is something that took a conventional wisdom 
of the game of baseball and reinvented it. 100% um, of teams who win baseball games score more runs than the other team. So the way you score runs, you put runners on base. So the way you put runners on base, you focus on who are the players who, who get, get, get me on base. And those aren't your traditional people that you always see, but very simplistically, what Billy Bean did was take a conventional model and turn it upside down and focus on that. And that's something that I think we all have to do in our businesses, and we all do it to an extent in our businesses every day. Um, but that's something that I'm a numbers person by nature, so that's kind of how, how I'm wired. Uh, at, at work, they call me Timmy Bean. So um, instead of Billy Bean, I'm Timmy Bean, which also, if you're in Okahumka, if you don't have an IE or a Y on the end of your name, you're nobody. So uh, you fit right in there. Um, you know, one of the big things is focusing on what makes you money. Um, you know, we're not here to make, we're not looking for experience. We've all gathered experience over time, but really, truly understanding what makes your business money. Uh, in the private equity model, we had a company that we owned and uh, the garbage truck manufacturer. And we made front loaders, side loaders, and rear loaders. And if you asked our sales, the head of our sales department on the rear loader, as we started to get into the numbers, we realized every time we made a rear loader, we lost money. So his answer was, we'll make it up in volume, don't worry. Um, <laughs> So, you know, quickly really in understanding what are the true things that help make you money and focus your time and efforts there because that's where you need to be spending your time and efforts. Knowing your margins and your bill of materials. That's something that I challenge all of us. Uh, we've, we've had our challenges at Vactron and it's something that we've really focused on over the last many years is looking at what truly is our cost. You know, the days of just the mentality of how are we doing, call your banker, is there money in the, can in the account, we're good. Um, are long gone. So it's really understanding what are the things that help you drive your business and really focus on what you're, where you're making your money. Where's your product line that's very, mar very margin rich? What are the ones that you need to either focus on or get rid of? And that's sometimes a very difficult de decision, but it's also on the KPI side, as, as the gentleman just spoke about, it's truly understanding your business and understanding it on a daily basis because that's something that we all get our financial package at the end of the month, and then we can look at it and we can say, huh, I can't fix that. I can fix it going forward, I can't fix what happened there. So one thing we focus on is daily KPIs of understanding, all right, what we, what's our shipments done by day? What have we done by sell by day? Because if I, if I focus on everything daily, I can react a lot faster than if I wait till the end of the month, and then it's just a post-mortem at that point. So really understanding that. We have dashboards at our company um, that we distribute weekly to the management team, but then there's also tools that we distribute daily to our groups to make sure that we're staying on top of. I know right now at Vactron we're doing 20 units a week. So to do 20 units a week, I can't do 15 of them on Friday. So I've got to be able to do, I've got to do four a day. So if I'm not doing four a day, I need to focus on today, why, what's going to prevent me from getting four a day done today, and then focus on it for tomorrow. So it's, it's really getting into the weeds, but it's also understanding what really is what's driving your business is a critical thing. Um, what's important and what's not important? You know, we see it time and time again. Uh, I'll use, we're always a good example. I mean, at, at Vactron, we 97% uh, of our units are either 500 gallon or 800 gallon units. So 3% are not. Guess which, guess which ones are the biggest pain in my side? The 3%. So, it's focusing on, you know, one, identifying, is there a market for that 3%? Are we just missing the boat? And if there is, how do we get better at it? Because we've got to identify, how, if, that, if that market exists for that 1,200 gallon unit, we've got to figure out how to do it better at our place. And it's something as with anything else. There are units that run down our line right now that used to always be a thorn in our side. The more you do something, the more you learn from it. But it's also understanding too, understand the market, where are you, and is it a market you want to be in? So one thing I know, our 300 gallon unit is a thorn in our side right now, but there's a market out there that we have to figure it out. We've got to go after it. The 1,000 gallon unit, there's not much of a market there. You ask a salesperson, that, that's the most important market, that's the one, because I've got a sale. You know, we've heard it time and time again. Make this one, he's gonna buy 20 more. <laughs> Usually doesn't pan out. Um, and just knowledge is king. You know, we're, data is everything. I mean, we're in a, we're in a in an environment right now where so much data is at our fingertips, take advantage of it and use it. Now that being said, you don't want paralysis by analysis, so you've gotta be able to react to it and know what's important and weed through the data to understand what truly helps you run your business and take you to the next level. 
cycles. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we all know our economy. You know, where are we on this chart right here? You know, some would argue somewhere on that expansion curve to the boom curve. You know, how close are we to that peak? But if you look over time, here's your cycle. Uh, also, all of us in our own businesses have our own cycles. Knowing whether it's seasonality or knowing that our work might be tied to government work, government defense work, where is that work going? So really, you've got to understand your cycles and where are we as a country, keeping a pulse on that, but then also understanding on a business side, where are you inside your business? We've had, um, at, at Vactron, we've had the past, it's, it's been a crazy growth cycle, but it's, uh, we've had back-to-back -back years of 50% growth. So we've gone from making 340 units a year to 540 units a year to last year we made 800 units, and this year we'll make 1,000 units. So we're 25% we're growth, which is, relatively speaking, um, it's funny to listen to some of the guys on the floor, they feel like we're slowing down just because we're not going 200 miles an hour, we're going 100 miles an hour. But it's something that knowing where, you're, where you are in your cycle, and, and I'll speak to it in a minute here, but it's what, what created that, op there were opportunities that presented themselves to us is why we grew to the pace we got to, and I'll get to that in a few minutes here. Uh, let me go back here. As far as knowing where you are in the cycle, we talked about that, staying one step ahead. I think that's something that, you know, when things are good, it's very easy to get lazy. You know, that's, a, but really that's the time we've got to prepare and react for the next part of that cycle, which is coming. So that's something that we really pr preach internally at Vactron is things are really good right now. Don't get lazy because that's when we get in trouble here. Um, and then bottom line is when it, when it does slow down, it's too late at that point. You know, when you see the smoke, when you see the smoke at the house, it's a whole lot better to do something then than when, wait for the flames to come up. So I think that's something that, you know, trying to identify when there's going to be smoke, staying in front of that versus waiting for the house to be ablaze. And at that point, it's a, it's a much cr more of a crisis here. Some of the keys to weathering a slow economy, supply chain. Um, we view our suppliers as our partners. And I think that's something that I preached to everyone, and I, I didn't even know Jim was gonna be here, but uh, they actually are a supplier of ours. And um, that's something that, you know, taking our supply chain, and I encourage everyone here, and truly viewing them as partners. If uh, the old culture at Vactron many years ago was, you would have thought we were NASA making rocket ships. You know, deliver your items at the gate, we'll take them from here. Um, we don't make rocket ships, we make vacuum excavators about as far from a rocket ship as you can get. Uh, but with that, time and time again, we've, had, we've involved suppliers in getting them inside the gate, walking through our plant and understanding that when they sell this to us, what we do is we take the back part off, we pop this part off and we do this. And if they understand that, they could say, well, why don't I just deliver it to you that way? That would be great, you didn't even know. And that's something that with Amazon, actually, we, uh, we buy a lot of hose for our units. Um, I can buy hose from anyone but it's understanding where is their value add that they can add, and that's where Jim and his team came in to identify what are you doing with the hose when I get it. When I get it, I take this, I put a cam lock in, I do this, I wrap it up. So now we're getting components delivered right from our supply chain the way we need it, which allows us to go from basically being eight units a week to 20 units a week within a two year time period. Because as you go through rapid growth too, you quickly realize where your bottlenecks are and you've got to address that bottleneck. And what we've done is move that bottleneck throughout the plant. Um, you know, that's a good question. How do we find each other? Well, I mean, you were a, a moving plumber. And that's right. Yeah. Got some out of the it was one of the um, one of the associations, and I uh, just it's you know we try to do as much, and I, I encourage all of us. It's like we try to do as much business locally as we can, um, because if I have an issue, if I have an issue with an with an item, Jim can have his team there in an hour. Uh, we used to buy that hose. Part of our issue there was we used to buy that hose from California. And so freight getting it from California here, uh, you know, it's sitting on a truck in Missouri doesn't help me today. So, um, you know, the benefit of dealing with local suppliers is they can react with us. And the other part of it too is, you know, truly having suppliers who want to be engaged. Somebody mentioned it earlier, you know, I, I don't want, don't, don't sell me a good, here's my problem, help me solve it. And that's something that Amazon's done for us, a lot of our suppliers have done for us is to help identify what's our pain point and what can you do to help me? I can go buy a commodity anywhere. Uh, but those are the things that really help add value and help you through the growth cycle. And then relationship side of it, we do business with people we like doing business with, bottom line. 
I mean, that's, we're, we're all humans here. Um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I like doing business with people I like. Uh, because at the same time, too, as you build that relationship, when times get tough, you know, you go to bat for your guys. And, and that's something that, you know, when, when there's open lines of communication, you've got that strong relationship, it goes beyond just buying a good or a purchase an item. I mean, and that's something that we really preach with our purchasing agents is to build a relationship with our suppliers because those are the lifeline. Our $45,000 piece of equipment cannot leave the yard if it's missing a $2 part. So we've got to make sure we have all the parts there, and we also need to know that when I need to call in a favor, I need to, you know, who I need to call. So, um, and then when things soften, not if, but when, um, your bond with your supply is going to be critical. I mean, we saw it time and time again at the private equity group where, you know, we had a company that we bought out of bankruptcy, and you know, try building a garbage truck with no money. It's um, it, it's tough, uh, and it's something that, but you build those relationships and you share your vision with your supply chain to understand where you're going and help get there. And like I said, we took that from bankruptcy to selling it to Navistar, and um, you know, and our suppliers played a critical role in it. So supply chain is a critical thing as far as weathering that slowing economy. Other thing is customers. You guys just mentioned about it, diversification. Uh, diversification is critical. Um, I've lived on both sides of that. Uh, Vactron is an example where Vactron was 95% of our business was through the Vermeer dealer network. So almost everything we made went through the Vermeer dealer network, which is a great dealer network. Um, but if that contract didn't get renewed, boy, your world gets turned upside down real quick. So we are focusing more and more of our time developing who's the Caterpillar dealers in the territory, knowing how you diversify, but then also just diversifying your product outside of certain industries. Our product used to be tied to oil and gas. You know, we've seen that wave. Um, and so that's something that diversifying our products, so oil and gas, infrastructure, industrial, uh, municipality, those are things that help you weather the storm, but also diversifying you know, who your customers are. Uh, one of the benefits we had, and this was part of the challenge that was presented to us, and it, it worked out well in this case, was we had 95% of our customer was Vermeer. We had two years left on our contract with Vermeer. So uh, one of our main competitors was really struggling and down on the mat. So we took an opportunity of a huge influx of orders, and as opposed to saying our lead time went, our, our lead time is normally six to eight weeks. So instead of telling our supply, our customers that the lead time is now 16 weeks because we have double the orders, we said, no, we're gonna take the challenge. We're gonna figure out how to keep our lead time between six and eight weeks. And you quickly identify how you move that bottleneck throughout the plant, but then what it allowed us to do is have our market share go from 14% to 39% market share. And we got ourselves in a position with Vermeer where they said, I can't not have you, so we have to buy you. So that's something that, in that case, it worked extremely well. But diversification of customers is a critical thing, especially to slow down, because the last thing any of us want to be in that situation of that customer has 95% of your business, sends you the letter, and you're scrambling tomorrow. Um, also, as far as... Uh, Firing a customer. This was a, something that we really went through with a couple of our companies at the private equity group, was taking that exercise of firing a customer. That customer that is just that mental drain, that profit drain, and just saying, I don't want to do business with you. And, and working and doing it in a professional way, in a right way. But um, you know, I challenged all of our companies with making sure that who is that customer that we want to talk about firing? And either by firing it generates the discussion of if you're going to stay here's the new price, and if you're not willing to pay that, then that's fine, let me help you transition somewhere else. But firing a customer sometimes, it's the old 80-20 rule. You know, those, those, one, those are the ones that are the drain that impact the overall organization there. Uh, and then it's okay to say no. You know, uh, the old days of, uh, you know, yes to everything, and, and we've all been through that chapter of our life where even at Vactron, um, you know, as we grew the business, if a customer said, I want a vacuum excavator and I'd like you to put a kitchen sink on the back and throw a microwave underneath, we'd say, yeah, we can do that for you. Um, you know, it's not a good customer experience. You don't want a kitchen sink on that thing, um, nor do you want a microwave. So it's helping them understand what do they need and what is our product that we offer and what need does that address for your, for your concerns. So that's something that, you know, okay to say no. And then a voice of customer, something we are very big on is doing surveys with our customers, doing surveys with our dealers, 
our product now looks a lot different than it did even a year ago just from feedback from the field as to what are the likes, what are the dislikes. And then I also encourage, you know, we get our engineers out in the field. You know, we can design something in the computer all day and say that thing looks great. But until you put that thing in the ground and see how it works and how they're using it, you really realize where, where the pain points are. And understanding that is a critical thing. And just keep your discipline. Know, know who you are, you know, and don't, don't sell your soul. Uh, and at the same time, you know, keep your discipline as to what is your business plan? What's your vision? What's your two-year strategic plan, three-year strategic plan? And what's the path to get there? Knowing that the journey is going to take you on waves. If you would have told me when I graduated Notre Dame, 25 years later, I'd be running a vacuum excavator company in Okahumka, Florida. <laughs> I don't think I would have taken that bet. Um, but I think that's something that the way that the journey takes you, it's, uh, you know, you, you stay strong in yourself. We're big on the golden rule. You know, and, and we used to call it the private equity group, the, the newspaper rule, that whatever you do, if it's printed in the newspaper and your family saw it, you'd be okay with whatever it said. So, you know, stand strong to your integrity in, in that. Um, and then get resourceful. Um, you know, th those are the times that, you know, when, we, when the tech bubble burst, you know, when we realized we had 25 different networks and 25 different billing platforms, you got resourceful. And it's amazing what you can do when, uh, when, you, when your backs are up against the wall. Um, People, um, you know, I think it's something that we are, especially in today's economy, in today's day and age, the hardest thing of everyone here is finding good people. And then when you find them, it's keeping them. Um, you know, we, I'm very, I'm very hands-on. I think all great managers are, you surround yourself with good people. I, I'm, you know, I, something that's a major cultural change is, is, uh, historically at our company was two people made a decision, and that's the direction we went. I'm very big on if we get eight people around a table here, we're gonna come up with a much better answer than if it's just me or just myself and two other people. So involve your team and then that, what that generates is truly engagement from your team. You know, it's not a job, everyone does it for a paycheck, I get it, but also truly getting engagement. One of the things that Vermeer does is they do a 12, customer, a 12 question survey for all employees every year. And it's to engage, it, it's, it's to gauge engagement satisfaction and disengagement from employees. And one of the things that they saw was at the Okahumka plant that our engagement level is higher than any of the other companies they've purchased. Now that's a team, that's a team effort there. These guys would run through a wall for them and they know I'd run through a wall for them. So it's something that truly engaging yourself with your workforce and going that extra mile and doing stuff. I mean, we, we do, um, yesterday was Tuesday, every other Tuesday we do a golf league at, at Vactron. And if you guys want to see bad golf, <laughs> come up there in two Tuesdays. But man, do we have a great time. And it's those are the things that build those bonds with your employees that, you know, when times get tough, which they will, they remember those things because they know what the good times are and how you take care of your people, but also when times are tough are the times you got to roll the sleeves up and, and work through it. Innovation, one of the things that we've, we've prided ourselves on is I, I have an acronym that I call it SILK, and that's something that our goal is to be the leader in support, innovation, lead time, and quality. And regardless of whether you're making a vacuum excavator or a gray iron casting or a garbage truck, um, you know, focusing on those items uh, are a critical thing, but also on an innovation side, you've got to stay ahead. You know, we can't be stagnant. Uh, vacuum excavators have come a long way from what they were uh, and they're continually evolving. But I think that's something that keeping a focus on innovation and how you redefine your product, whatever that is, uh, to look at what's the next technology out there, what's the best, the better way to make the widget, and focusing on that. And then, like I said, just staying on top, staying ahead of your competition. Uh, you know, focusing on truly having a pulse. Right now, when things are really good, it's, like I said, it's easy to get lazy now. Uh, but now it's the time to figure out what's that next chapter of our lives and, and where that goes. And then also taking risks, but making sure that those truly are smart risks. Uh, we've all made a lot of bad decisions in our life, myself included, uh, but also at the same time too, putting yourself out there sometimes is, is how you take that next step and, and go there. What is your priority? So to be the leader in support, innovation, lead time, and quality. So that's our culture that we have at Vactron with our dealers and our customers. Um, so. As far as the good times, you know, as we, we live in a world of cycles and, and times are really good right now. Uh, but I also, I encourage everyone here that now's the time to be that squirrel stashing the nuts, but also understanding that 
that time is going to come, and it's the things that we're doing now that will make you ready. Truly understanding your business, that's something that, um, you know, and, and we have a very good pulse on it, but there's things that we can learn every day. And I, I'm big on surrounding yourself with good people, but I'm also very big on Billy Bean and Moneyball and truly knowing the numbers and the statistics and understanding what are those things that are truly important for your business and what are the things that are just noise. Because, you know, you don't want to focus on the noise, you want to focus on the things that help you steer the ship. And the benefit we always have as a smaller company is, I always use the, the boating analogy of small companies in this, in this country are, are the speedboats zipping across the water. Your larger companies are your barge. I've gone from a speedboat for a barge now, so, uh, you know, we're, we're transitioning that culturally, but it's something that, you know, barges get to be barges because they were speedboats, typically. So, uh, I think that was it. So, any questions? Yep. I work with uh, CITP certified pipes. Sure. Is that all they're bringing? Sure. Yep. So what our what our technology, what our product is, very simplistically for everyone, it's a shop vac and a pressure washer on steroids. I mean, you're you're spraying high pressure water on the ground, you're sucking it up. It's a safer way to dig. So as opposed to using a backhoe or a shovel, you're spraying high pressure water to soften the soil. You're sucking it up. So then you're locating. You're putting eyes on the utility lines, uh, whatever those are. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yep, exactly. So, um, so that's something that it's becoming more and more in Australia. It's mandated that if you're going to be excavating, you have to be using vacuum excavation. Uh, it's becoming more and more mandated here. You've got companies, especially in the. And especially the infrastructure, and this is why we're bullish still on, you know, the overall economy is the infrastructure can has been kicked year after year after year. It's coming to a head. It's coming to a head. Um, you know, the, the amount of water that is unaccounted for in the state of California is mind boggling. Um, the infrastructure work down in South Florida and Miami, um, you know, just the, the infrastructure is getting more and more dated and there is no roadmap that exists. There's no, you, you'll see the spray paint of the flags. It tells you there's generally speaking something generally there, but uh, don't, don't throw the back out and go digging. Um, so that's something that where our, util, where our equipment is being used is to help locate and, and be an insurance policy a lot of times mm -hmm. for places. So. Not so much in the cleaning of the, like before they do the repair. Yeah, ours is more for locating it. Okay. Yep, and then we'll use it for like directional drills for the uh, slurry material pickup. You know, the days, the other part of it is the days of just Fill the tank up and yeah. go dump it wherever you want. Or Has going. Vermeer completely moved away from the digging ditch? No, so, the, so Vermeer, I mean, obviously, trenchers is a big part of their business. Yeah. So it's a complimentary product that really goes si hand in hand with it. So you don't see that brand, the no, digging ditch part, as much. No, that's right. And it's something that the vacuums have gone, the vac excavators have gone from, they were such an afterthought, you know, they, to now, it's the, actually the third highest volume product that Vermeer sells. Um, Yep. Are you involved in the uh, demucking of the Indian River and things like that, where they suck in the vacuum in the bottom of the river? Yeah, we are not, but actually it's interesting. So part of the innovation side of it, when we had the Gulf oil spill, we created a, uh, um, a vac, a slurry vac, that was sucking up all the oil balls. So we, we make smaller units, so the, you see a lot of those big sewer sucker trucks being <coughs> used for that. But I mean, our technology can be used for it. Um, the Vermeer dealer network is very strong in the underground space, but there's definitely opportunities there for sure. Hey, Tim, um, how many people were, were part of the organization prior to the, uh, the roll-up? So, uh, so on the Vactron side? Yes. So Vactron's gone from, we had 45 employees two and a half years ago. We have 106 employees as of right now. Wow. Wow. Um, and what's, what's really benefited us is relationships with Actually, Valencia has been a good source for us. Uh, Lake Tech up in, uh, up in our neck of the woods. Um, because that, you know, finding good people in this job market's tough. Well, to, to that end, um, what, has, has there been any turnover from the prior, uh, from the prior organization? No, it's actually, it, it, this, this acquisition's been a great thing for everyone involved. Really? Uh, because the other part of it too is, as a small company, we have a lot of benefits for our employees, but as a much larger company, it brings a whole set, another set of benefits to our employees. Um, 
you know, so from things of additional paid vacation days, um, which on the production side, I'm not a huge fan of, but that's all right. Uh, but, um, but no, so that's something that, you know, those are things that uh, the 401k plan, plan is better. So I think those are things that we're now able to offer benefits of a billion dollar company to employees in Okahumka. So your, your leadership team now, mm -hmm. is it the same as it was? Have you added people? What's been the assimilation of that? Yep, that's a good question. Uh, so what our, our management team is still intact, but what we've done also, it's been a unique situation. Vermeer used to own one of our, well Vermeer still owns, one of our other competitors was a company that they've owned for the last two years. So they used to be our enemies, and now we're all family. So, um, so we've, we basically have combined management teams, which has been a great thing. It, now it's a transition, it's, you work through it, but it's something that's been great because it's something, they've got a lot of great people in South Carolina, we got a lot of great people in Florida. You pull those together, and back to the whole Clydesdale analogy, you know, you're, you're, you're pulling a lot more with everyone. Everyone focus on the same thing versus combating each other. So, any other questions? All right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.